I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and, not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Find out what the issues are. Find a way to get them fixed. Build relationships with the players. Let them know that you care about them. Let them know that they can trust you. You trust them. And then you start to dive in to the X's and O's part of it. Today's guest on this archived episode from the Coaching Coordinator Podcast is Chris Ash. He's currently the defensive backs coach for the Las Vegas Raiders. When we talked to him on the podcast, he was the head coach at Rutgers and had just completed his second season as the Scarlet Knights head coach. We were excited as he was the first Big Ten coach to appear on the podcast. Before coming to Rutgers, Ash served as defensive coordinator at Wisconsin and Ohio State and was part of the staff on the Buckeyes 2014 College Playoff Championship team. After a 24-year career as a college coach, including roles as Rutgers head coach, defensive coordinator at Texas, Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Arkansas, he joined the Las Vegas Raiders as the defensive backs coach and is entering his second year. On this episode, we discuss culture, building a staff, recruiting, evaluation, phases of the year, and more. This one's full of useful takeaways, and we'll share those on our Winning Edge takeaways at the end of the interview. Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School defensive coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. I am excited to be joined today by our first Big Ten coach, the head football coach at Rutgers, Chris S. Coach, great to have you here today. I appreciate you taking the time. No, hey, I really appreciate you for having myself on uh, your podcast. I've listened to them in the past, and I think they're outstanding and, and really excited to be a part of it. Coach, you, having listened to these, you know we always like to start with questions about the coaching journey. And, you know, you've spent 20 years as an assistant getting yourself ready for the, the position which you're in now to lead a football program. And, uh, you know, talk to us a little bit a, about that process. And, you know, you have the, the typical path. You know, you, get, you finished, you became a GA, and you really worked your way up through uh, different positions through college football. And, uh, you know, obviously now the head football coach at Rutgers. But talk to us about some of those things you've learned along the way that have helped shape and develop you as a coach. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Keith. There are a lot of things I learned along my journey. It's been a long one. It's been a great process. It's a fun one. And uh, when I became a head coach, I realized how much I didn't know, how much I still had to learn. So I'm I'm still learning every single day. But I've been very, very fortunate in my career to be uh, influenced and and, uh, impact by several head coaches as well as assistants that I've worked with. I've worked with some outstanding assistants that I've learned a lot from. You know, as a, as a young coach, uh, I made a decision that this is the route that I wanted to go in, a career that I wanted to go in. And what I did is just dove right in and, and all my focus, all my energy was towards becoming the best coach that I could become. I started going to clinics when I was young, 
I started ordering, ordering videos. I'd go to camps. I would do anything I could to soak up knowledge and information from other coaches, older coaches. Started going to the coaches' convention, the AFCA convention at a young age, just trying to learn. And uh, every year, just uh, uh, took an opportunity to figure out uh, some new things about the, the profession. You know, as I got older, I really found out that uh, I needed to start focusing on leadership as well. You know, I was, uh, as a young coach, just focused on scheme and uh, recruiting and you know, learning the, the, the game. But uh, as I've gotten older, I've, I've come to realize that the leadership part of it is a missing aspect for a lot of young coaches. And that's something I've really tried to improve on in myself. But it has been a fun and long process. And, and anyone that's in that uh, journey right now, the only advice I can give you is to stay focused and keep getting better every single day. Coach, as I went back through in preparation for this this interview and looked at some of the things that were being said about you and kind of you know focusing on your growth as a coach, I think the one thing I saw is that th- there was a consistency for you. You weren't a guy who was looking at shortcuts, and a lot of people talked about you just doing it the right way, being prepared and doing it the right way. How important was that? to the, this process of you, you know, reaching at least the level you're at right now. I'm sure you have other goals moving forward, but accomplishing your goal of becoming a head football coach. Yeah, uh, Keith, I really appreciate it. You know, people saying you know, positive things, but I mean, it, it's, it's true. Just focus on the process. Uh, the thing that I did do as I was going along my journey is I did set goals. I started out as a young coach at Drake University. I was a volunteer. Uh, I became a graduate assistant. Then I uh, had to go uh, be a restricted earnings uh, uh, coach. I was a graduate assistant again at Iowa State at a young age. Gave up a full time job to go do that. And every every step of the way, every move I made was just a another opportunity to learn. Uh, I made some moves that people scratched their heads on. You know, why would I do it? Why would I leave this job to go to that job? And I looked at it as an opportunity to grow and learn and make myself better. And that's really what it was all about. It had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with titles. It was, hey, could I go work for this coach or this program? and make myself better. And that's uh, what I did. But yeah, there are no shortcuts. Uh, I, I look at people right now, young uh, coaches right now, and uh, they want to uh, put their themselves in the, the head coach's chair right away after they're done playing. It just doesn't work that way. You know, I was willing to do anything I needed to do to get a foot in the door and, and uh, move forward. I mean, I've done laundry. I've, I've, I've mowed the grass. I've painted the lines. I've driven a bus. You name it, I've done it. And um you know, that's just part of the process to, to really get you to appreciate this profession. And then when you get these opportunities as head coach, there's really no aspect of the program that you don't understand because you've done it all. And uh, that's that's one of the things I've really appreciated about my experiences is, is I've been forced to do a lot of jobs other people didn't want to do, and it's made me better. Coach, when you look at some of the people you've had the opportunity to work for, work with along the way, some uh, incredible names there, Hall of Fame coaches, future Hall of Fame coaches, you work with Chuck Long at Wisconsin, had obviously Barry Alvarez had influence on you. Urban Meyer, Jerry Kill, you brought him on staff. Uh, I believe he's a, a future Hall of Famer as well. Looking at some of those guys or even others that I didn't mention, can you point to maybe two or three things you've learned from some of those guys along the way that really had an impact on your development? Yeah, I, I can mention a few things. I'll, I'll start uh, when you you list the people that have uh had an influence on me or an impact on me. It really starts back to my high school coaches, to be honest. And even further than that, I, I first had an opportunity to play tackle football in the fourth grade. And I still remember uh, to this day, I, I, I didn't come from a, a wealthy family, it really came uh, from nothing. And football changed my life. The people that I've uh, been influenced by because of football have changed my life. And I go back to my fourth grade when I first played tackle football. I had a youth coach, bought me my first pair of cleats. I've never had a pair of cleats. I was one of the you know, few players on the team that didn't have a pair of cleats. who didn't have money to buy them. And honestly, I didn't even know what they were because I'd never been exposed to it before. And my youth football coach bought me a pair, and I, I thought it was uh, one of the greatest days of my life. you know. And all the way from there, that was the first probably impactful moment that I had. I had great high school coaches that influenced me along the way. Uh, I wasn't a great player, wasn't a great student, You know, made some, some poor choices along the way. But I had high school coaches that believed in me and wanted to make a difference in me and stuck with me and really gave me the opportunities I needed to, to go on and have a successful high school career and make it to college. My college coaches were great, and then I got into this profession and uh, really started with a guy by the name of Dan McCartney. He was a Caden Fry, Barry Alvarez uh, disciple, uh, really taught me about the value uh, of relationships. He was a great leader, a great mentor, but he was probably one of the best I've ever been around in terms of building relationships with people and uh, with players, and I learned a lot from him. 
go to Wisconsin and, and uh, learned a lot from uh, Brett Bielema uh, and also uh, the impact of, of Barry Alvarez on my career during my time there. Uh, a lot of the the, the people that I've uh, been around, they, they come from the Hayden Fry, Lou Holtz tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dan McCarney was uh, Hayden Fry. He was a Barry, Holt, or a Barry Alvarez guy who came from Lou Holtz and Hayden Fry. Brett Bielema was a Hayden Fry guy. Uh, I was with Barry there at Wisconsin and you know, again, he'd just come from Notre Dame. Then I go work with uh, Urban Meyer. He was a Lou Holtz guy. I've been fortunate to be around people from the same tree that believe in the same thing and really have helped me build my philosophies and my beliefs. But when you talk about just some specific things that those people have taught me, one, it is about relationships. This is a relationship-based business, coach to coach, player to player. You know, those things are so important, and and that's what we try to pride ourselves on in our program right now are are the strengths of the relationships built on trust. And uh, I learned a lot of that from Urban. Uh, Talked about program alignment. I don't care what level you're at, NFL, college, high school, alignment in your organization on how you want things to be done, the way, you know, people believe, the way they behave, the way they work. You know, it's so, so important. And uh, that's something I learned from Urban. So I've taken bits and pieces from everybody. But one common theme is about relationships. Every successful head coach or assistant I've been around has been great at building relationships. Coach, obviously all that builds into a culture. And, and I, you know, every, it's a buzzword today in some respects. In, in some ways, it, it's almost cliche. And with anything in this profession, you're going to find guys who do it really well and guys who maybe miss a little bit and don't quite get it. Before we got to talking, I mentioned I was out at Ohio State and had the opportunity uh, to spend some time out there at their practice, uh, watch what they were doing, and also chat a little bit with with Tim Kite. And when I look at the Buckeyes, and and I'm sure this is something that you've brought over from them, their culture saturates every single bit of what they're doing. It doesn't stop because, okay, now here's our offense or we're doing this in practice. I mean, it is their, their program is steeped in culture. In, in moving over to Rutgers, I've watched some of the videos of you, to, you know, when you're taking over the program, some of the things you're saying, and I mean, it seems you have a very well thought out approach to what you're doing here to build the program, knowing it's going to take time, but going back to things like focusing on those relationships, making sure your guys are doing the right things and, and uh, getting everybody, like you said, aligned. So important to do that. That alignment is uh, an important part of that as well. Talk to us a little bit about those things. And, and obviously, I think some of that that you've learned and brought over from the Buckeyes. Yeah, it's uh, ironic that you mentioned that, Keith. We just actually had uh, about an hour and a half staff meeting this morning with our staff talking about where we're at with our, our culture and our behaviors. You know, we, I, I like to think we're uh, very crystal clear with what culture is and what we want to see in our program. But they are the, some things that I've learned along my journey and, and uh, really saw come to fruition at Ohio State. And uh, we're, we're trying to do the same thing here. The first uh, part of it is to understand culture isn't built overnight. Uh, it takes an insane amount of time and effort and energy, you know, uh, to, to build it. And you can never sleep on it because the minute you do, it takes a step back. But we've tried to be very, very crystal clear with what we want our football program to, to be, you know, how, what we want our, our players and staff to believe and how we're going to behave. And we just c- communicate it all the time, you know, uh, constant communication, education, and motivation to get these things done. And uh, there, there, there's not a long list. You know, we were talking this morning, you know, uh, if we could get our football team just to play with relentless effort, just go so hard, you know, you have a chance to overcome some talent and, and mistakes. And we can get our players to focus on their, their daily habits and being the best that they can be every day with their, their uh, strength and conditioning, their nutrition, their hydration, their film study, their academics, their social decisions. If they can focus on great daily habits and, and, and uh, being the best they can be every single day, it's going to help them make plays you know, on the field and earn the trust that they need. And then the last thing is we just talk about the brotherhood of trust. If we can get a team that loves each other and does everything for each other, uh, you have a chance for success. So that's really what our culture is about, going hard, great daily habits, and uh, making the right decisions and and, uh, having a foundation of trust and love uh, with the people in the organization. If you can get those three things done, you have a chance for success. It is so, so hard to to build it and maintain it and, and keep making it better. But uh, that's what we're trying to do here, and uh, I feel really good about where we're at going into year three. Well, I think we're right on target uh, with our three-year plan from when I uh, got here. And again, it's just uh, an insane amount of work and effort by a lot of people to make it happen. It's interesting that you you brought up the three-year plan. It's something that uh, Brian Kite and I have. You know, he's he's done some podcasts with us here. We talked about quite a bit 
in that we are in in an on demand society and we want to see results immediately, but to really to to build a culture and to get your program performing where you want and obviously there there is really no maintain you have to keep on that path it's going to take 3 years you know to to get you to that elite level of of culture and, and performance where that really is is driving everything and i think we've seen it in the growth and sometimes people measure it in wins but you know just looking at what's what's been going on in your program in 3 years that's the trajectory you seem to have it on looking back from you know day 1 to right now, what are what are some of those key points along the way that y- you would say, hey, here's here's some benchmarks we reached, or we got to this point, and then here's what we had to do next? Yeah, uh, Keith, you know, we we did come here with a three year plan. We were hoping if things went perfect that we could, you know, get uh, hopefully to postseason play after year three, and, and and that's not been our focus. Our focus has been the you know the process, and you know, it started year one. We took over a program, and we just needed to identify you know what the problems were here and uh, come up with a plan and solution to get them fixed. And I think we were able to do that. That was what year one was about. It wasn't about winning games. It wasn't about developing, you know, uh, the fundamentals or the offense and, and defense. It was, like, okay, here, here, what were the problems uh, in the program? How do we get them fixed? Just so we could then get to a point where we could focus on some of the other things. We wanted to establish, you know, what our, our uh, culture was going to be and then build on it. And we did that in year one. Year two, it was about improving you know, get the problems fixed uh, that were in the program, get a solid foundation built. And in year two, we wanted to improve. We want to make sure that our, our practice habits were better. Our social behavior was better. Our academics improved. We made a huge jump in uh, our, our APR from year one to year two, where I mean, we went from uh, a 931 to like a 980 something. And the APR is one of the biggest jumps in America. Uh, we didn't have social uh, problems, off the field problems. Our, our players uh, policed each other. They made great decisions on the weekends. We're not perfect, but uh, our social behavior was a lot better. Our voluntary workouts that we would have, uh, they went from maybe about you know, 40 to 50% participation to 100% participation. So we could see things going in the right direction. You know, we have a champions club that, that we have where uh, we break uh, the year up into four different quarters. And the number of players that were uh, earning champions club recognition just continue to increase uh, each year that we've gone, each quarter and each year that we've gone. So there have been uh, minor benchmarks that way that uh, have helped us improve, you know, and, and then on the field in year two, we wanted to show improvement. We went from zero Big Ten year, uh, wins in year one to three in, in year two. And I feel like we, we have a solid foundation. We have a pretty good understanding of our, our culture that we want. And then uh, year three, we, we've got to show drastic improvement, hopefully have an opportunity as a byproduct to go to a bowl game. And, and that's really kind of the, the way it's been laid out. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. See, the show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Coach, kind of flipping gears a little bit. Obviously, uh, you made a big name for yourself on the defensive side of the ball, and uh, you were able to uh, really leave your mark on a number of programs in taking their uh, pass defense, especially. You really became known for pass defense and what you're doing in the secondary to you know elite as far as Division One football and, and what you're able to do statistically. And we've seen that again, you know, amongst different jobs that you had, including um, your last stop at Ohio State. You know, for you, and, and just looking at that segment of it, what was that process like when you came in and, and you, you knew you had to uh, you had to make the team better in that regard, and that was the uh, responsibility on your shoulders? What was your approach to be able to do that in, in each of those situations? Uh, very similar to, uh, you know, taking over the program. First and foremost, you you got to survey the situation. 
okay, what what uh, what is the situation? What what have been the issues? Uh, what do you have to get fixed to get to where you want to get to? And, and uh, that that's the very first step, just identifying the problems. What are the the what have been the roadblocks, the barriers for a team, especially a team that has talent? Uh, what what do you got to do to get it fixed? Then the, the the next part is just about building relationships with the players. That that uh, foundation of trust has to be there. You know, as I've gotten older in my career, I, I really truly uh, believe in the, the old saying that players care uh, more about coaches that care about them. You know, before they care about coaches that uh, and, and what they know football wise. Right. You know, so I've really tried to to build relationships and and uh, anywhere I've been with the players and get them to to know and understand you know, who I am, what I am, and that I really care about them. And I want to help them be successful in all areas of their life, because that's really what's important. If they don't know that stuff, and they don't feel like you have their best interests in mind. They don't care about, you know, four or three press quarters, you know? Mm-hmm. So th- those are some of the steps that I've taken. F- find out what the issues are, find a way to get them fixed, build relationships uh, with the players, let them know that you care about them, let them know that they can trust you, you trust them. And then, then you start to dive in you know, to the X's and O's part of it. Coach, I know in researching that the idea for you is is to recruit great talent and continue to develop it. And you look at the tremendous facilities you guys are putting in, certainly those things become a part of recruiting. But, you know, seeing that even as the, the biggest tool you have to help develop these guys and in listening to what has been said about spring ball that you just finished up here, a lot of the people who watch you guys day in and day out are saying that, you guys have some talent in place now, and, and uh, that was impressive in coming out of spring that there's playmakers that they, they maybe didn't see in the past. In that process, though, you know those are guys you've had to bring along. It's not about all, hey, we're going to bring in this transfer and this and that, that it is part of the process. It is part of the three-year plan. How important, you know, as you once you get away from building the relationship – is it that every member of your staff is a really great teacher, especially in terms of technique? Uh, it's everything. You know, uh, if you look at the history of, of uh, the NFL or, or college football, so, you know, wh- why do, you know, NFL teams that get a bunch of first-round draft picks, you know, not succeed? Well, there, there's something missing. You know, in college, not everybody's going to uh, go out and recruit four- and five-star, you know, athletes all the time. And if you do, that's great, but it's, it's more about what do you do with them when they get on your campus, and it's about developing. And uh, there's a lot of things that go into de- to a developing players to reach their full potential. And, uh, you know, our job is uh, – I don't care where you're at, all coaches need to go out and get the best players that they can get, but even more so than that, they need to develop them. You know, once you get your culture set, it's that individual development, the, the mental development, the physical development, the fundamental development, the football IQ. Your coaches just have to do such a great job of teaching and monitoring that growth and that development. And you know, when you look at our football team right now, you know, we've built it on, you know, three star recruits and, and we've developed the, uh, the players physically, mentally, fundamentally. Football IQ wise, I think we've got one transfer on our roster right now, a kid that's transferring and hasn't been in this program as a high school player. And uh, there's just so much that goes into it. You just can't ever sleep on it. And uh, our job is to try to uh, put together a yearly plan that allows us to maximize the ability of each player. You know, I'm not concerned about stars next to a guy's name. I'm concerned about how we make players that we get in our program the best that they can be. And if we can do that consistently, then we're going to win a lot of games. Coach, keeping track of those things and seeing how they're developing along the way. What's your system for doing that? And, you know, I guess give us an overview. I'm sure it's very detailed, but how do you, you make sure those guys are progressing the way you need to see them progress? And what's the continuous e- evaluation and tool for doing that? I learned this saying from uh, Urban Meyer. Football is evaluation friendly. You know, you can either go thumbs up or thumbs down basically every day based on how you practiced or, or uh you know, uh, how your meetings went or how your off-season workouts went, you know, it's either good or bad. But what we've done is we break our year up into four quarters. we got quarter one, which is our off-season drills. It's our strength and conditioning drills. It's our, our special workouts that we do, our mat drills. It's to build mental and physical toughness. And then uh, also in that, we have some uh, you know, position conditioning drills that we do to try to help develop uh, the fundamentals of the players in quarter one during the months of, of January and February. And then uh, quarter two, we get into spring practice, and that's when we uh, really start to focus on the, the fundamental uh, part of it uh, with footballs and the scheme 
uh, and we install what we want to do uh, X and O wise. So quarter one, it's the, the mental and physical a part of it. There are fundamental elements there to it. Quarter two, it's uh, installing the scheme in, in spring ball. And then uh, we get into quarter three, uh, which is a summer, and it gets back into conditioning, uh, mentally and physical uh, conditioning, strength uh, conditioning. But it's a lot of player run practices uh, during the summer. You know, so we install in the spring, uh, we wrap it during the summer, uh, and then we get to training camp, and then it's about trying to perfect, uh, you know, what we're trying to do through reps and things during training camp and practice during training camp. But that's really how our our year is broken up: quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four is the season. And each quarter, we have uh, specific objectives that we want to get done through the uh, development. And what we do after each quarter is we sit down as a staff, and we go back through and have conversation about each player. You know, where are we at? What did you know? What did we set out to, to accomplish in this quarter? Did we get that done? And if we didn't, we got to make sure we can somehow make it up in, in the next quarter. But each quarter of the year, we're going back through to evaluate uh, what we did, how we did it, and talking about each player specifically and the progress that he's made. Coach, I know, obviously, to be able to pull that off, you have to have a great staff. And uh, I think the biggest challenge you, you have in the beginning of any program is making sure you bring in the right group of guys who can go out and execute that culture. What was your, I guess, formula in looking at you know staff and bringing those guys in um, at the beginning for you? Yeah, uh, hiring a staff is everything uh, for a head coach because uh, your success or failure is going to rely on the guys that you surround yourself with. That's that staff and players, but really with the staff. And I, I really use the, the Tim O'Brien kite. I, I call it the four C's. You know, they, they talk about the three C's of trust. I call it the four C's of coaching. You know, I wanted guys that had high character, that they could be trusted. Uh, I wanted guys that could connect with players, connect with recruits. Um, I wanted guys that were extremely competent in uh, coaching the, the fundamentals and techniques at their position. And then the fourth thing was compatibility. I, I wanted guys, and I want guys that are compatible to me. Because if, I'm, uh, if I've got a bunch of guys that don't think like me, don't behave like me, don't attack their work like me, it's not going to work. And that, that's really probably a very, very important piece that not a lot of people talk about. You know, our culture is is – exclusive not inclusive or uh, it, it's going to take a special coach to be on the staff and you know that that's hard to find but those are really the four things that I set out to try to find in each coach that I uh, brought onto our staff and one of those coaches you brought in is is uh, Jerry Kill and was with you for a season and, and we obviously all know uh, the struggles with coach Kill has with his health but you obviously felt it, it was worth bringing him on board and you talked about you know, what he brought to the offensive side of the ball, a head coach mentality, and, you know, a guy who could help uh, align the talent of the players and help build an offense, not just for that year, but for the future. Um, what was Coach Kell able to do in his, his short time there, and what are some of the things you've learned from his example? Well, first uh, and foremost, he just get back, gets back to those four Cs. You know, he was just a, a, a tremendously high-charactered individual. Players uh, trusted him. Players loved him. There was great connection between him and the players. He was extremely competent, really understood the game, uh, could coach uh, offensive football. Uh, he looked at it from a head coach's perspective. You know, what do we need to, to do to win? It wasn't just about offensive stats and scoring points offensively. What do we really need to do in the program to win football games? And, and what's my role as an offensive coordinator to make sure we get that done? And at this day and age, that, that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, everyone's concerned about their yeah. stats and, you know, uh, their system and, scoring points and it's not about hey what do we need to do as a program and that's what I really appreciated about coach Kill was he looked at it from that standpoint and uh, you know he just attacked his his work like you'd want a a head coach to do or a head coach would like his assistants to do is he just uh, you know was in early stayed late was always on task complete alignment with me on how I wanted things to be done Uh, I knew that the the offensive staff was going to be in order and in shape and and that he was going to be on top of what they were uh, doing and I just appreciated that in Coach Kill. The thing that I uh, noticed about Coach Kill, and it kind of gets back to our earlier, you know, early part of our conversation about what have I taken from coaches that I've worked with and, and uh, for, and it was about relationships. He was such a good relationship builder. Uh, he made uh, great relationships with the administration, the, the uh, support staff, 
you know, I, I would see, you know, somebody on the support staff had an issue. They would go to, talk to Coach Kill and talk to Coach Kill because he was a good listener. And he just had, had seen a lot of different things and, and could offer some good advice to people. So I appreciated that part of it. He was able to keep some things off of my desk and out of my office that would bog me down. And, and he was able to take it on uh, himself. And not everybody can do that. So I really appreciated that part of Jerry Kill being here. Coach, another uh, hire of yours is a guy you brought up from the high school level, Nunzio Campanelli, who uh, has been involved with us at USA Football, was a coach for our uh, U19 team in 2012, and obviously he did an outstanding job at Bergen Catholic as the head coach there, winning a state title. You know, he's at Don Bosco Prep, just some great programs in New Jersey. For a guy like that, what are you looking for in saying that, you know, this guy's been at the high school level, but I know he can make a difference in my program? Yeah, we had an opening. Um, when I got here to New Jersey, I obviously I'm not from New Jersey. Uh, a lot of people wanted me to hire a, a high school coach. Well, at the time, when I, when I got here, I wanted to do that. I just didn't know who the right one was yet. So I didn't do it my first year. But after I got here and I started watching the coaches here in the state of New Jersey work, you know, it, it gave, became crystal clear to me that Nunzio was uh, a top-notch co- coach. He was elite. Just all the things that I talk about with, with our staff, he had them within his program. He had a uh, great connection with the players. They had a great culture. He had a great staff. They all were aligned with him. Any time that I watched him work, you know, they were impressive. Uh, when I'd go to clinics, he and his staff were always at clinics. They're always trying to make themselves better. And the result was they won, and uh, they won a state uh, title this last year. And as I had a, a, a job open on our offensive staff, and I was looking for who was the best fit, not not necessarily the most experienced, a guy that had been in college, who's the best fit, uh, who can make a you know, big impact in our program, not only with our current players, but just in recruiting. It was a no-brainer for me to go get him and, and try to get him here because he fit the four C's that I wanted, and also he had connections within the state. He, he had love for uh, uh, Rutgers and uh, wants Rutgers to do great here in his home state, so it was just a no-brainer. But it didn't matter if he was a high school coach, an NFL coach, a college coach. He fit me. Uh, he fit what we wanted here, and I'd watched him work for a couple years, and, and uh, I thought he was one of the best high school coaches I'd seen. I appreciate you taking the time and being here on the podcast, and you guys certainly – are, are doing a great job in following your three-year path and, and bring your team right along on, on a trajectory, I think, that has people excited there in New Jersey about Rutgers football. But as we're taking a look at, and, and you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of things that you do and you're doing to build your program, what is the thing that you would point to and say, you know, this is the key thing for us, this is what's going to give us the winning edge that we need to uh, be able to take this to the next step? You know, uh, I get asked that a lot, Keith. You know, what's the one thing? And I'll be honest with you. There, there's not one thing. It's just it, it. There's so many things that go involved. Uh, you know, are involved in winning and go into it. It's, it's just so hard. The the thing I can, uh, I guess, I could pass on to to other coaches uh, about what I hope happens here is just uh, as a head coach, I'm just so crystal clear uh, about what I want with the uh, the staff and the players. And if I'm just crystal clear with the staff and the players and just constant communication, education, and motivation to get that done, that's going to help us get to uh, our goals and, and be successful. There's Other than that, there's no uh, magic fairy uh, dust. There's no magic wand. There's no one thing. It's just being crystal clear with what I want in this program as the head coach. And then I get everybody else aligned and believe in it, uh, uh, that those things are important and just constantly communicating educating and uh, motivating guys to get it done. That, that's really it. And if there's one thing, you know, physically that I want is just guys to play really hard. If we can get a football team that just goes really, really hard, you know, the, 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 uh, the rest will take care of itself. It'll overcome whatever talent deficiencies, uh, you know, we may have compared to other teams for other mistakes that, that come up. But uh, that, that's really it. Coach, I appreciate you taking the time here on the podcast. Uh, really enjoyed the, the conversation and uh, I like what you guys are doing. I certainly would love to have you or your coaching staff back at any time. Keith, I, I really appreciate the, you and, and what you're doing. It's a great thing. And, you know, right now, just to end up, you know, our, our game is under attack. And um, it, it really, you know, hangs heavy on my heart. The football just changed my life. It really matters. And any coaches that are out there listening to this podcast, you know, I just challenge everybody uh, to do everything that they can to try to save and preserve our game and make it the best it can be. And, always try to find ways to make it a safer game and, and uh, look at the way that you teach and coach and 
uh, how you deal with your players to, to make sure that this game is, is always as strong as it is right now because uh, it is under attack, unfortunately, and we got to constantly look at what we're doing and how we do it and continue to make it as safe as we can. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Here are our winning edge takeaways and ideas for implementation. One, solve problems first. When taking any new position, there'll be issues that need to be resolved. Some jobs have bigger problems than others. Whether you're in a new job as a position coach, coordinator, or head coach, there will be things that need to be addressed. And it's best to start there before you get into all of the things you want to establish or install. The best place to start is with a conversation with each of the players within your position, unit, or team. You may want to put together a simple questionnaire that can serve as a conversation starter. You want to understand what's worked well for them and where they feel there can be improvements and then take those into account as you implement your plan. Coach S started with solving problems knowing that those would need to be addressed before they could have any impact with the X's and O's. Two, be patient. It takes time. As mentioned in the episode, a three-year plan is a good place to start. Everyone wants to come in and make a big impact, and sometimes the talent and major shifts you make in a positive way align and the results happen sooner but having a long-term, big-picture vision and plan allow for you to move things progressively in the right direction. Three, Coach Ash's four C's are a useful standard for a head coach putting together a staff, but also for a position coach or coordinator looking at a new job. Remember, interviews are a two-way street. Whether you are hiring or interviewing, the four C's can be a useful measuring stick for determining if it is the right fit. As a reminder, the four C's of coaching, as Coach Ash identified, are character, connection, competence, and compatibility. Coach Ash does have a resource available on CoachTube on tackling. He does an excellent job with tackling. I'll share that one in the show notes. Be sure to go to coachingcoordinator.com for our enhanced show notes with our winning edge takeaways detailed in text. Sign up there for our weekly tip sheet which shares the best ideas from the previous week. And if you have ideas yourself, please reach out to me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski or email me, Keith, at coachingcoordinator.com, and we'll talk about those and set up a way to get them recorded.